We've driven 14,000 kilometers in our Tesla Model 3 since we picked it up in May last year, exactly one year ago. And the second most popular video on my channel has been this one. But a lot has changed since then. So in this video, we're gonna go over what it's been like driving and owning this car for the past 12 months. So what a year it's been. I look back at that first video and I think about how much has changed, both from what we've learned, because we have learned a lot about this car, and also on the charging infrastructure and what's happened in the community and how many more Teslas there are on the road right now. So definitely a lot has changed. I'm gonna go over some of those things in this video. Also looking back on our delivery experience, which was not a great one. I did a whole podcast episode talking about that, which I'll link below. But also like, while it's interesting in that people would maybe have that experience when they're picking up their Tesla as we did, I feel so silly listening to it knowing that, you know, we were concerned about the range, we were worried we were gonna run out of battery by the time we got home. All of these things that we've come to realize are not an issue and I was talking about them being an issue in the podcast and in some of my older videos. So, I mean, that's life, hey? You learn as you go and you adapt and electric cars, fundamentally, Tesla especially, they are so different to normal cars, whether people realize it or not. So it definitely takes time to get used to and you have to sort of retrain your brain into like planning for charging stops when you go on a, wrong, a long road trip. So there's all those little things I mean, 14,000 kilometers in 12 months is a bit of driving. We've certainly been enjoying taking this car on road trips over our Mazda CX-5. I think we've visited seven out of the 15 superchargers we have here in Victoria. So we've done our rounds. We've traveled up to New South Wales and tried some of the chargers up there. And overall, this car is an absolute pleasure to take on road trips. Autopilot makes a massive difference to highway driving. We are planning a trip around Port Phillip Bay in the car on a single charge, which will be lots of fun. So stay tuned for that one. Hopefully we'll be able to film that in the next few weeks. We haven't yet charged the car using one of the free chargers available mostly in the city, but I've heard good things. They're obviously slow, but free charge is free charge. However, with all of the referrals that we got through starting this YouTube channel in the early days, now Tesla don't do referral codes, but a lot of people used our referral code, which resulted in us having a lot of free kilometers to use superchargers. So we still haven't paid for any supercharging, which has been amazing. So thank you to everyone that used our referral back in the day. We've had varied success with the third party chargers. It's like a 50 50 in terms of a lot of them just don't appear to be working, which is incredibly frustrating, especially if it's the only charger around the area that you're staying, like the one in Dalesford that's been broken for us twice. But then we've had great experiences where they've been super fast, the app's been easy to use, and it's just worked really seamlessly. I mean, they don't compare to the Tesla chargers where you just pull up, plug in, and the car sorts out the rest. One thing we learned early on is to be mindful of the destination chargers that show up on the Tesla map. Often they are just for customers of that particular business. We have only used them on one or two occasions um, when we've stayed at like Mitchelton Winery, for example, they had destination charges there. But yeah, you do really have to be a guest to use them. They're very different to public charges and the supercharging network. We've had no issues with the supercharging network. We have an, quite a good amount of them across regional Victoria and they are super easy, super fast, great to use. So if you are planning a road trip and you have a Tesla, then it's good to plan for a stop at a supercharger, ideally, if it's sort of in that area that you're going to. PlugShare has been an amazing app to use when you are traveling as well, because there's obviously that review system where you can see if a charge has got a problem, you can see photos, things like that. I know there's some other great apps out there as well, like a better route planner, things like that. So it's good to have those apps on your phone should you need them. But in reality, in our experience, like we're mostly just using Tesla superchargers, thankfully. 
And 95% of the time, we are charging this car at home using the supplied cable going plugging straight into a normal power point. And so not only is that potentially better for the battery long term, we've never found ourselves, not once, or maybe once, needing a faster charger. So now when you order a Tesla, you're given the option, do you want the standard power point cable I'm not sure what that's called, or you want to pay $700 for the wall-mounted faster charger. So in our experience, charging at home using that normal cable is the way to go. And it also means when you travel to other people's houses and whatnot, and you go on road trips, you've got that as a backup. I feel like you always need to take that with you. So I would advise every single person that is looking at buying a Tesla to start with that that's that normal power cable and go from there. If you're someone that is doing a lot of kilometers for work on the daily and you're needing to charge up quicker overnight, I feel like it's a rare situation. Like we've done the numbers on it and it's like you'd need to be doing a lot of driving like to justify it because overall we've been pretty impressed by the range in this car. We've completely eliminated our range anxiety. That's not something we have anymore. It's definitely something we had at the beginning, but any new people coming into the EV world, you don't need to worry about it as much as you think you probably do. Going up and back to Melbourne for us in a single day, which is over 200 kilometers in total, coming back home and having still half the battery left just eliminates that, knowing that there's chargers around, knowing that there's superchargers, and then knowing every time you leave the house in the morning or whenever, you're leaving with a full battery. And this being a LFP battery means that we can charge it to 100%, which originally for the first, I don't know, several months, we assumed that we could only really charge this to 80 and on special occasions go to that 100. So, I mean, these are all the things that you learn along the way. I feel so silly looking back on all of that stuff, but that's the reality. I think the advertised range for this car was like 420 kilometers. Um, we find with highway driving, we're comfortably getting like 370 kilometers. If it's not highway driving and it's just a lot of driving around town and stuff, it's more than that. Like it feels closer to 400. So I guess as a simple answer, um, it's a little bit less than advertised, but it does a very good job. And there's also like quite a big reserve, you know? So once you get down to those really low battery percentages, let's say that you hit zero, there's still a reserve in the car, like a petrol car. Um, and it will eventually, not that we've had this experience, but it will eventually tell you, hey, we're actually running out of power. You need to pull over. You need to, you know, park the car safely because things will start to shut down if you really push it. But getting to 0% doesn't mean that it's game over. There's still a little bit of a reserve for you, which is nice to know, but definitely don't push it that far. We definitely have a lot more confidence in this car. And speaking of confidence, that brings to mind autopilot, which is all about, you know, having a level of confidence, not full confidence, but a level of confidence that the car is going to be able to drive for you safely. And so the more you use autopilot, I feel in our experience, the more you sort of fall in love with it and you understand how it works. You know when it's a good time to disengage, you know when it's a safe time to engage, all of those things. And it is a driver assist feature, right? But it's an amazing one. And I am hard pressed in all of my research and YouTubing to find something that's better than autopilot and more reliable and works on a variety of different you know, settings and roads. So it is definitely one of the standout features of this car. Autopilot is a bit of a game changer. Interestingly, one of the initial features that we absolutely loved about this car, which is Sentry Mode, we've kind of gotten sick of, which, you know, hear me out, it's a great feature and I would never want it to go away. It's an awesome security feature to be able to have and record things around the car. But the software is still a little bit glitchy when it comes to sentry mode. So what happens is you go to the supermarket, you're in the supermarket for half an hour, for example, you get back to the car and you have four sentry mode events, right? So you click on them and you try to just spend a little bit of time in the car going through them, seeing what was happening around your car. 99.9% .9 of the time, it's something uneventful. It's like a car moving or someone walking past your car. And so there's that investment in time in checking all the sentry mode clips when most of the time nothing bad has happened. And then additionally, the software being a little bit glitchy when you're trying to play back some of those clips 
Um, that will get better in time, mind you. But at the moment, it's just a bit of a naff. So there's been occasions where we've been turning sentry mode off because we know it's not going to be useful and it's just going to annoy people. The other thing is like overnight, sometimes if it's raining or there's like a tree moving in a certain direction or light hitting the camera in a certain way, you know, we'll get back into the car and we'll have 300 sentry mode events or something like that. There's also that concern of like the headlights flashing when we park at Paige's parents' place. Those headlights are flashing into the house across from their place, which is a bedroom, you know? So like there's all those things to kind of consider when you do use sentry mode, but like I'd still say 90% of the time we're making sure that it's on because it's very, it's very nice to know that the car is recording. But it's not perfect. <laughs> the white interior we've been really happy with. It hasn't required as much cleaning as we initially thought it might. Um, it's really durable and it just wipes down with like a wet cloth and sometimes you can use a little bit of soapy water to go that next step. Interestingly today is like one of the first times I've gotten in the car and gone, oh, these seats need to clean because there's really only been one or two occasions in the past 12 months where we've actually like properly cleaned the seats. Um, so that says a lot, pretty amazing. The paint on the exterior of the car, we've been happy with, I guess. I mean, there is some stone chips, uh, which is a little bit annoying. Um, so maybe consider getting like some sort of like paint protection film or even a ceramic coating. The glass roof has not really been an issue um, in summer. We had some really hot days and you do feel a bit of that radiant heat coming through the glass, but you get used to it very quickly and the rest of the cabin cools down pretty quickly. So yes, you can go and spend some more money getting extra tinting, you know, third-party tinting hasn't been a massive issue for us. It's interesting too, there's a lot more Model 3s on the road here in Victoria than there was 12 months ago when we first got it. Like initially those first few months of us driving this car, we would get stopped. Um, people would ask us questions. People would stare at the car. And now like last quarter, I think it was one of the best selling cars in the country. Teslas are definitely a thing now. <laughs> The Tesla app, we've been using a lot more than we first did when we got the car. We've come to really find it a great feature. Um, jumping on, checking that the car is locked or checking the location of Paige or she checks my location when we're out and about. You get to see the speed of the car, the exact location. That's a really useful feature. It's like so much better than Find My Friends. We've only had one trip to the Tesla service center, as you saw in my recent video. That was for a rattle in the back right door, which they seem to fix pretty easily, which was great. No quality issues. We do have some minor panel gaps if you're really looking out for them, but like it doesn't bother us at all. I feel the quality and the feeling and the interior of this car is better than anything else we've owned. I have had a BMW 3 Series, a Mini Cooper S, a brand new Mazda 3 SP25, a Honda CRV. We've gone through quite a few different cars and this is just like a whole nother level. So like people jumping on my TikTok and talking about how bad the quality is for Tesla. Well, like I'm telling you as an owner that's had a lot of cars, that's been in some really nice cars that this is special, like, and not to be concerned about the quality. I do actually need to go back now for that 12 month checkup. As I've stated in my maintenance video as well, they need to just check a few things in the car. Um, it's probably gonna cost around $80 or so. So yeah, I will book that in hopefully in the next few weeks and do a video on that as well. We've taken the car camping, which was a lot of fun. Uh, we've had both the dogs individually in the back seat of the car. Never thought that that would happen. Never thought we'd see the day. But uh, yeah, they both had a go in the car. We got to try out dog mode. That moment was kind of convincing us that the Y would be uh, a great option for us. And then we could kind of just go back to having one main car that the dogs can go in. Also, you can probably see that is my e-tag. Not a bad spot to put it if you've got a Tesla with a big glass roof because it's not sitting up the front windscreen looking ugly. It's kind of like tucked behind the back. And yes, it works perfectly fine going through an e-tag station. As you would have seen from my previous videos, we took this car to the drive-in. That was heaps of fun. I tried to sleep in the car with a mattress that Tessery sent me. That was fun and interesting. We've done a lot of exploring and adventuring in this car. Overall, I think in summary, I would say this is all round 
a very capable and incredible car. The performance never gets old. Putting your foot down in this car still feels as amazing as it did on day one. The technology is best in class, like nothing comes close. Autopilot is a standout feature. The software updates, the app, I mean, I don't want to seem biased. I just feel like we've got a great car and I don't want to be like one of those Tesla fanboys that says nothing negative. There's areas for improvement always, but I do really believe that this is one of the best cars on the road. A lot of people will disagree. A lot of people will disagree because they don't realize that it is. They've never driven one. They've never had that experience. I'm overall just very grateful that we've been able to drive and own this car. Maybe we'll need to sell it. Tesla shares have been going woeful. So who knows how long this is going to last, but we have been pinching ourselves every day. We have been loving it. Anyway, I hope you guys have found this video interesting. Let me know in the comments if you're um, waiting for a, a Tesla, if you're interested in getting a Tesla or any questions, I'm happy to help. Um, hit me up on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram. It's all linked there in my bio. And uh, yeah, looking forward to making more videos. I'll catch you guys soon.